Hey everybody, thank you so much for clicking on this video. A few months ago, I made a video breaking down the issues I see with women's fitness specialists and made the statement that training for men and women really isn't that different for general population. I got a bit of pushback about that, so today we're gonna talk about it. Today I wanna discuss three proven differences between training for men and women in the gym, and I will give you some ideas of how to just consider that for your own training. Now, two things quickly. This video is not gonna touch on things like pregnancy, menopause, training during your period, simply because men don't experience those things, so I don't think that it's relevant to include in this video. And two, I will be using the terms man and woman kind of interchangeably with male and female, but I do understand that there is a difference in sex and gender. And if you don't understand that and it makes you upset, Goodbye. I just simply am using those terms interchangeably to make things a little bit clearer and easier to understand. So thank you and let's go on. <laughs> so the first difference I wanna talk about is that women typically recover faster than men. There are plenty of studies that show this and it's not 100% proven why, but there are some different hypotheses here. The main thing that I've come across is that women typically have a higher ratio of type one muscle fibers than type two than men. So type one muscle fibers are going to be more oxidative. They're your slow twitch muscle fibers. So think of things for endurance. So pushing yourself for a long period of time. Type two muscle fibers or fast twitch muscle fibers, these are gonna be more of your short bursts of energy, more of your explosive movement. So again, typically women tend to have a higher ratio of these endurance muscle fibers. So they are able to get more oxygen to their skeletal muscle a little bit faster than men, which means they can recover faster between sets or even in between workouts. This tip typically means that women can handle more volume during any given training session than their male counterparts. Now, from my experience working with clients, I would actually agree with this for the most part. I do have three male training clients. If you are one of the three and you're watching this, hello, you're about to be featured in this video anonymously. Now, out of those three male training clients, I would say the two of them do need more recovery time between sets and our sessions than most of the women that I train. But then on the other hand, I do have a male client who does perfectly fine with the exact same amount of rest time, I would prescribe to a female client. Most of my female clients typically recover pretty quickly in between our sets during sessions. But on the flip side, I do have two clients I can think about off the bat who are women who need about the same amount of rest time as those two men who need more rest time than most of my women. I only point this out because I'm making a statement here of women recover faster than men, but it's not 100% true all of the time. I just gave you two very real life examples that I work with every single week. So this isn't a hard and fast rule, meaning if you're trying to implement this into your training with your clients, you just simply need to know that it might be an issue and pay attention to the individual. I actually wanna give you a real life example that I've had to navigate specifically with my female clients. So let's say you're a female client of mine and you are doing split squats and I give you a set of 15 pound dumbbells, we hold them suitcase style and you perform eight reps. And after those eight reps, I ask you to give me an RPE or a rate of perceived exertion. Typically how I ask this is give me a scale of one to 10 of how hard that was, 10 being I couldn't do another rep with good form. And this client gives me a seven out of 10. 10, meaning they probably have two to three good reps left in the tank. But I notice they're pretty much ready to go after 20 or 30 seconds right into their next set. If you just took this information of women recover faster than men, you would go, great, this woman just recovers really quickly. Let's go for another set. To me, because I've worked with enough women and I see a lot of the information that's pushed to women about being weak lifting light weights. I typically see that women just pick lighter weights and think that that's the intensity that they're supposed to feel. So what I do in this situation is I say, great, for our next round, we're gonna go until failure. So we're gonna go till you cannot keep going. So what happens? They have their 15s, they get to eight reps, I say, keep going. All of a sudden we're at 10, all of a sudden we're at 12. Now we're at 14. Finally at 16 reps, this client cannot do another rep with good form. So we went from eight reps at a seven out of 10 intensity to 16 reps at a 10 out of 10. So that tells me that her first round of the eight reps was more like a four or five. So I don't necessarily promote going to failure all of the time with your lifts. It's honestly not gonna be the best bang for your buck with training general population, but it is a good tool so people can actually understand what failure feels like, and then they can adequately gauge that RPE scale of one to 10. So with this client specifically, it wasn't that she's a woman and recovers faster. It's that she's a woman and 
she was afraid to lift up heavy weights because no one's ever told us we can, right? So what I did in that situation, now I give her 20s. Now we're trying to figure out if this is a better working weight to hit that seven, eight RPE that I was trying to get her to hit during the day. So my tip here, whether you're a trainer or whether you are a man or woman training in the gym, don't take this as a hard and fast rule. Understand what it's actually like going to failure. Understand the intensity or the RPE that you're trying to hit for the day and take your feedback from there. Don't take your feedback from something that does have truth to it. But again, everyone is going to be different. So the next training difference is that women typically have less upper body strength than men. So what this kind of means with training is that women can just move less weight with their upper body than men. And this really comes down to differences that occur during puberty. During puberty, men are going to start producing more testosterone. And quite often this leads to broader shoulders, which basically just means bigger chest, bigger shoulders, bigger muscles. You know, bigger bodies can just typically move more weight. It's pretty simple. Now, once again, as I have male clients that I can pull from anecdotally, let's see if this holds up 100% of the time. Two of my male clients can 100% move more weight with their upper body than me. But the other one actually moves about the same amount of weight as me with my upper body. Body. So how would I approach this in training? Honestly, I think you just come into a session knowing that like if you have a male client, they're probably going to have a higher baseline than you for pushing and pulling strength because, you know, of their anatomy and make adjustments and what you have programmed based on that. Like it's, it's honestly not very different from how I would treat a female client. You know, if this person is brand new to me, whether they're male or female, and I go into a first session with them, I'm going to ask them for a lot of feedback in terms of what weights to grab. For example, let's say we're doing a dumbbell chest press for the first time. I'll say, hey, we're going to do a dumbbell chest press. We're going to do this for 10 reps. What weight would you typically grab? So they'll give me a weight. I'll grab the dumbbells, we'll go through the exercise, see how it moves, and I'll ask them for an RPE. And again, we already kind of learned how to gauge an RPE if a client isn't super well-versed in what it actually feels like to go to failure. So again, the approach is the same regardless of gender. It's just about understanding the biases based off of gender going into your sessions. The final difference that I want to point out is that women seem to be more prone to ACL tears. This is a fun one. Well, not like fun, fun, just like... There's a lot of different hypotheses here, so let's get into it. So according to recent studies that we have on female athletes, women are six times more likely to tear their ACL than their male athlete counterparts. I want to make it clear, though, that the studies and the stats that I'm referencing right now are from athletes not general population. But I still think that there is some crossover into general population. So we're going to talk about it. So in terms of the sports world and, and, you know, again, pulling this information from athletes, one of the hypotheses here is like, oh, well, there's just more women in sports now or in like in professional sports than men. So of course that number is going to go up, but it still doesn't necessarily explain why that number is so much higher like than the ratio with men. Does that make sense? So another hypothesis here is that it actually just comes down to anatomical differences because women typically tend to have broader hips than men. Broader hips are there for an obvious reason, childbearing. But because women tend to have broader hips, it's actually going to be harder then to maneuver the knee underneath of it. This is why you see a lot of women with knee valgus or basically where the knees cave in. You know, if you never learn proper landing, jumping, pivoting, deceleration mechanics, your risk of injury to the knee is going to go way up. And if you're already kind of set up for failure from an anatomical standpoint, this is probably why why we see more ACL tears in women than men. So again, even though this overall stat that I'm pulling is from female athletes, I do think that it still has a lot of crossover into general population, not only because of anatomical differences between men and women, but also athletes are actually trained in all of these things, proper landing mechanics and pivoting and deceleration. General population typically is not unless you grew up competitively playing a sport and had really good coaching. I just remember a friend of mine from back in my theater days, she was telling us a story about how when she was a kid, she was a cheerleader and it was the end of practice and they had just gotten done doing all of these stunts and flips and jumps and all of this stuff. And a mom brought cookies for the girls and she reached down to get a cookie and tore her ACL. Not from cheerleading, from reaching down to get a cookie. <laughs> which is kind of fucked up. It's a fucked up story, but it's it's like, it does show you that a lot of times, number one, whether you're an athlete or not, ACL tears are typically going to come from non-contact injuries. And number two, this is still something that can happen to general population. I can actually name three people off the top of my head, all of them women, I know personally who have torn their ACLs this year. So all of that to be said, 
how do we implement this into training? So obviously we wanna make sure that the knees are tracking correctly in our basic compound lifts. I'm also gonna make sure that clients can navigate different landing mechanics, decelerating, moving in multiple planes of motion. You know, my big belief system is that you don't need to train like an athlete, but you do need to be athletic. And finally, I'm just gonna make sure that we include some hamstring exercises in our training because there are a lot of studies that point to the fact that better hamstring strength actually does help protect the ACL. Now, here's the thing. That that's all for women, right? I do the same thing for my male clients. One of my male clients tore his ACL years ago. I feel like I see football players every other week tearing their ACL from non-contact injuries, right? So it can happen to anybody. So with all of my clients, regardless of their gender, I'm going to make sure that they have good technique with their knees in the exercises. I'm going to make sure that they can land and pivot and decelerate and move in multiple planes of motion. I'm going to train their hamstrings because it's great for a host of other reasons. You don't need to take this as something that only applies to women. You just need to take it that your female clients or you as a woman might be more susceptible to an ACL tear and just make sure you're hitting all these checkpoints. But again, you should be hitting all these checkpoints whether you're a man or a woman. Okay, let's wrap it up and let me explain to you what I want you to take from this video. The biggest influences in your programming should not be based on your gender. Your gender might influence some small aspects of it, but the number one thing that should influence your training is your goals. You know, if one of my male clients and female clients had the same goal of getting their first push up, I'm going to approach that goal in pretty much the same way. We're going to make sure in our sessions we put push ups at the top since it's your main goal. We want to exert the most energy right there. I'm going to slowly up the volume and intensity over the weeks that we're really focused on this goal. And I'm going to make sure that we're training the shoulder from multiple different directions to avoid injury and make sure that it's a well rounded joint. Now, the gender part of this does come into the back of my head because I go, okay, well, my male client, broader shoulder overall is starting from a higher level of upper body strength than my female client. So he's just probably going to get there first and that's okay. But again, the basics, the approach is the same. There's not a completely different approach just because someone is a woman. Gather information, pay attention to their progress, and then adjust from there. Now, like I said at the very beginning of the video, there's obviously training differences for pregnancy, menopause, maybe during your period. I have a whole video about that if you want to know more. I do want to dive more deep into menopause training because there is more and more research coming out about that. I think that it would help a lot of my audience, and I'm really hoping to bring on an expert to the channel in 2025, so stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I do actually have a video coming out later this month that talks about some of these programs that are geared toward women's health issues that are very predatory, things like cycle syncing, things like PCOS, because unfortunately the research is not there to support training recommendations for those yet, which is unfortunate, but there isn't really recommendations for it. So I want to make a whole video talking about that and make sure that you understand when you're choosing a program to help support your goals, if there's actually anything substantial there in terms of studies and proven results that have been replicated time and time again in controlled settings, or if it's just bullshit. So stay tuned for that and to make sure you do not miss it, make sure you hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next one.